dreams. Um, and you have to understand that we're, we're, we're now thinking uh, 50,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago when people were sharing dreams. You know, they, they would have a dream and they would share them, presumably. Mm -hmm. So who knows, but. Um, so uh, dreams were always thought of as involuntary products right. of the mind, you know. I, I did not produce it. And so they're an index of me in mm -hmm. a way that only involuntary things can be. Uh, and they can't be dishonest signals, you know, so. Right. So when I share a highly emotional dream with a lot of bizarre elements, it's a costly signal because I'm, I'm sharing something about me which is involuntary and it has this elaborate information about me and yet it's putting me on the line and the tribe and so on and so forth. So, you know, under all this baggage, the theory undoubtedly collapses, but I still have a sweet <laughs> spot for it, you know. That means that us dream researchers are more evolved. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. That's that's what the costly signaling hypothesis would predict. But the, the 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 ones who load high on the dream spectrum, you know, that are close to their dreams, that want to share their dreams, pay attention to their dreams, where dream images um, um, escape into waking consciousness, and you're right on that borderline where you know you're slipping into a hallucinosis, you know, but you're not. You're still in contact with reality, but but you're still you know that the costly signaling hypothesis would yeah, say yeah. yeah you're you're you have the best genes. But then what about animal dreams? They're not sharing their dreams with anyone, but I think they're still dreaming. Yeah, they're, they're, I agree. I I do think animals dream, mm -hmm. and. Um, the costly signaling hypothesis would work for them by making them do stuff that, you know, act out their dreams in some way. You know, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I just came up with that hypothesis 15, 20 years ago and, but I've never worked on it. And because yeah. I could never think of a way to gather data to, to falsify it or to really test it, you know? Right. So, I just didn't pursue it. Yeah, again, so um, Mark Blager was doing some work on dream sharing and empathy and functions of, of sharing dreams and he's finding, well, I think we, this has been found before, but that, that sharing your dreams has benefits for yourself, but also for the people who listen to the dream. I believe it. So it increases empathy towards the person who shares their dream and it there kind of go. is what you're saying, that they're revealing themselves in a very honest way. Um, and it's kind of, it's a, dreams are weird like that. You can be very, you can share some very personal details without feeling as, as a, I don't know, nervous about it because it's like, it was just a dream, but it's also, it's, it's it still really reveals yourself to somebody. Precisely. Yeah. That's, that's what makes them special mm -hmm. socially. Yeah. You can say, you can own it and still disown it. Yeah. You know, you know, you can say, Hey, I had this dream last night, you know, and it involved me like completely uh, you know, doing this inappropriate stuff with you, you know. And, uh, but now it's just a dream. It's just you know? a dream. Just a dream. So. What do you think of it? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and you have to realize that our ancestors shared dreams constantly. I mean, that everything we know about um, traditional societies and dreams were central to their groups. Mm -hmm. You know, like you see that in the accounts of uh, Native American dream traditions all the time. Right. And this, is, this was a regular thing. It's not just New Age bullshit, you know. The, 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 the Indians took dreams very, very seriously mm -hmm. to the point where somebody would share a dream. And if the tribe felt like that's a, that's a big dream, you know, they stop everything. They start to take the images in the dream, create garments out of them, create um, hides out of them, you know, create dances, yeah. songs, folklore. I mean, tools even right, came, right. came out of dreams, you know, so. Wow. 
dreams were generators of culture. You know, both when you look at the, the African traditions, dream traditions, you mm-hmm. look at Native Americans, you look at all these traditional societies, that, that comes across over and over and over again. The centrality of the dream for these uh, small scale societies. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have to assume dream sharing was universal and taken very seriously. And because, probably because it, 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 it allowed people to do precisely what you just said. That mm-hmm. this, this is really me, but not me. You know, so you, you, could, you could move into the social realm in this uh, liminal space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Accomplish things that you couldn't otherwise do. Yeah, I was thinking earlier, that is another part of the kind of the experiential quality of dreaming is that when you're in a dream, you feel, I mean, more uh, like connection to the other characters in the dream. You feel like yeah. that, that everything, myself and the characters in the dream, were all connected in a way. And I think that can kind of carry over into wakefulness too, which is part of the social simulation theory that, yeah. that it, it changes the way we relate to other people. And so... Yeah, the social quality of dreams can really, it can have a very kind of community building pro-social function if you, if you share them. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think there's even data to show that even if you don't share the dreams, mm-hmm. you know, that you, dreams can in, um, impel you to approach somebody. Right. You know, it, it, it can shape attachment patterns, I guess. Yeah. That's what I want to say. Um, 